So part two of the Elseworlds crossover is here and Batwoman debuts and I have to say this was an easter egg comic book fanboy filled episode and I really really enjoyed it so let's break down and review Elseworlds part two. <laughs> What is up people of the Arrowverse, welcome to my Elseworlds part 2 review and breakdown. Now obviously I'm sporting a Batman Christmas jumper, for in the spirit of Batwoman I suppose, and I've got the flash hat on, got the grapple hook, I think we're all ready to go. Uh, this episode was really fun, there was a shite ton of easter eggs in there, I don't think I've been able to name every single one of them, but... Uh, I was really impressed with the first episode, uh, the second episode. There was definitely some things missing for me, but I think perhaps are a result of overhype and I'll get to that. But regardless, I'm not going to negate how well I think this crossover is doing. But before we get into all of that, everyone, be sure to subscribe to this channel for more videos just like this, especially over the Christmas break. You're going to want to be dosed up on Arrowverse stuff despite the shows being on break. And other than that, like this video if you enjoyed this episode as much as me and if you want to show your support for the channel. Now, I'm sure quite a few of you noticed this, but back Barry actually did the uh, Green Arrow intro. It's like, my name is Barry Allen, and after six months in hell at Slab Side, blah, 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 uh, we saw moments of him, like, kissing Felicity, and it was just, I had to, like, rewind it. I was like, that is just so weird to see. Uh, we saw Laurel flip around the photo of uh, what was Stephen Amell in that courtroom when she was trying to free him from Slab Side, but it was replaced with a picture of Barry. I just thought that was a little cool detail to flick in there, because this was obviously the Arrow episode. Now, we're at the beginning of the episode as well. We got Diggle versus Deathstroke's son, like, reformed as Deathstroke, Joe, uh, this was really cool, Barry and Oliver came in to save the day alongside Kara, and, and as Diggle said, you know, something's got to be up, because when you three are together, it is, it is something big. Now, this is when we got the first Batman kind of tease from Grant Gustin, if you've been watching uh, my Elseworlds coverage before this, uh, I've been going over all what the stars have been saying and teasing, and that it would be a big Batman uh, kind of troll in this episode, of course there would be, since we're going to Gotham City, and that is when uh, Grant Gustin's Barry, or should I say Oliver, but Barry, uh, says, you don't believe Batman's real. And then I just love that kind of ego bruising moment from Oliver. He's like, come on, Barry, I'm the original vigilante, like me. No, not Batman, uh, me, just me. But other than that, maintaining that typical Elseworld humor between these main cast stars uh, from the shows, I loved it. Loved it in part one, and there was still much more to come after this. And this is when they all went to the bat signal. Not as much happened on this rooftop as what I thought there would be. Like, just Barry pulls, like, the rug off the bat signal, and then Oliver's still like, nah, nah. But this next moment I found pretty hilarious, just because we have three very powerful superheroes here. The Green Arrow... Supergirl and the Flash getting mugged by people on a Gotham City street. Of course, just go down the alleyway in Gotham, you're getting mugged. But there was a little Easter egg in this. I believe when the uh, GCPD officers pulled up, they were just like, you know, on the corner of uh, Nolan and, and Burton or whatever it was. Um, obviously, I shouldn't have to explain who Nolan and Burton are. I feel like they did a little bit more to emphasize the fact that Barry's getting quite into his Oliver Queen brutishness. You know, uh, he, was, he was standing on that guy's neck and he was told to stand down by Oliver. Uh, so, you know, I guess there was a bit of merit in what Iris said last episode, where she was just like, don't become Oliver Queen or the Green Aaron. I always just thought, come on, this is silly. But now, like, you can see that Barry is enjoying being that Green Arrow archer and, and being a bit of a badass, to be honest. Now, alongside this, in the episode, we learn that the Red Skies are disappearing, or should I say, like, following alongside wherever Barry and Oliver are. This is exactly what I said in my review yesterday of what I uh, thought was happening. I thought, essentially, it was, like, this side effect of reality changing, and it was kind of like a Voldemort cloud, if you will, following the subject matter around the world wherever they are and that, and that is exactly what's happening i'll talk more about the red skies a little bit later with the whole felicity curtis caitlin quantum mechanic -y kind of thing but anyway this is where they actually ended up in wayne tower themselves and this is where they were discussing bruce wayne which obviously we know is batman and they were really easily drawing that comparison uh, as well but like what they started saying was you know wayne left gotham three years ago to go where no one knows like so he left gotham and the way they made it sound there is that he left of his own accord he, he didn't necessarily go missing but then oliver said that bruce's board of directors went to town with a bunch of aggressive like get rich quick deals so i'm guessing like the wayne company name uh, especially after Bruce left, kind of went to shit. Maybe if he came back, he could recover it and become the top dog, like, uh, you know, of Wayne Enterprises. But, like, his board of directors, essentially, from the message, we got squandered everything, get rich, quick deals, down the drain, and, and now freaking Wayne Tower from the inside out is vandalized and stuff. And this is really crazy 
to even see. Like, I feel like this universe, because, you know, of the whole TV rights thing and blah, 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 is an Elseworlds universe because Batman should be there. I know they have come out and said as well that uh, Batman was the Arrow versus True, like, first vigilante, which is pretty cool. I don't know how I necessarily feel about that, but, like, still cool. I'm sure, you know, with all the other stuff we know out there in the Arrowverse, there must have been someone else, but okay. It should really, in theory, then be called the Batverse because, you know, they were saying that it's called the Arrowverse because Arrow is the first show. Technically, we haven't got a Batman show, but Batman was the first vigilante, so henceforth confirmed Batverse. But yeah, again, comedy shines through at this moment because, you know, when they were talking to Kate Kane, Oliver obviously doesn't believe in Batman. We've been over that. Barry does, but Barry is Oliver. So uh, when Barry said the line, oh, oh, you know, I would never compare myself to a total badass like Batman. That was just freaking hilarious because obviously he's speaking as the Green Arrow, or at least Kate Kane sees him as Oliver Queen. So, you know, he was kind of just humiliating uh, Oliver's true beliefs there. But either way, Kara using the actual real logic here. It's funny how Bruce Wayne and Batman left Gotham around three years ago at the same time. It's kind of very obvious who is who, but that's when Kate Kane uh, came straight back and said, you know, when Batman left the city, it went to five different kinds of hell. And that took a toll on Bruce. So he left and uh, now this is the really confusing thing they're only giving us little pellets of bird feed if you will and we're just like plucking the floor trying to get all these clues uh, up about batman and what actually happened to him now the fact that kate kane and this is going to into a bit of a batman breakdown here but i'm you know obviously very interested in this uh she said you know when batman left the city it went to five different kinds of hell that took a toll on bruce so to me at least that means batman left and bruce didn't leave straight away he just still stayed Bruce Wayne in the city, you know, for a little bit. And then I'm guessing after seeing uh, what the city turned into after he hung up the cape and the cow, he also couldn't bear it and left Gotham and he's been missing ever since. Now, this is actually believable for me. Maybe something happened that kind of broke Bruce or at least the Batman side to the point where he couldn't go out as Batman anymore. Stayed in Gotham for a bit, but as I just said, couldn't manage to see the city turn into five different kinds of hell as Kate Kane put it herself. So he ended up leaving as well. Makes sense, right? It could have been a bunch of different things. Now, Kara and Kate Kane did get a little bit more deeper into this when Kara went into actually the Wayne Enterprises Bruce Wayne office, which was really, really cool. And that's now Kate's like little chilling place because she's kind of taking over the, the building and turning into this real, this statey kind of place. But either way, like Kara was saying how she wonders if about keeping his private life from the public eye broke him a little bit, Bruce Wayne that is, and this is where Kate says that Bruce didn't leave Gotham without a fight though, like, you know, you learn not to break growing up in Gotham City, as she and her cousin Bruce did, so, like, she's saying he didn't disappear without a good reason, but either way, I found it fascinating, the, the thing to take out of this is the fact that when Batman left, that took a hard toll on Bruce, uh, and then he left. So what do you guys think in this chain of events as to why Bruce gave up Batman before giving up Bruce Wayne as well and leaving the city? What made him hang up the cape before he left the city as well as his public persona, Bruce Wayne? More comedy and a password that nobody will crack, and that is indeed Alfred Pennyworth. I mean, or should I say the, the actual Wi-Fi password to Wayne Enterprises is Alfred. I love it. It couldn't be better than that. I think I might change my Wi-Fi password to that. Don't don't hack into my Wi-Fi. Oh, and the last thing about Batman. I know I've been going on about this for a little bit, but you know, I freaking love the Batman. But anyway, it's when Kara said, my cousin is actually frenemies with Bruce. So what I take this as is that's not Earth 38 Bruce Wayne slash Batman. It could be, it could be. But she was saying it, she was honestly saying it in such a way that it was the same person. So maybe they've been using interdimensional extrapolators or whatever it is to get across the uh, Earths, um, or at least Superman has, to uh, go out with the frenemy that is Bruce Wayne or Batman. But, you know, come on, Kara, if you watch that scene again, was definitely making it sound out like, you know, her cousin Clark Kent, Superman, was working and has worked with the frenemy of his, Batman from Earth 1. I mean, at the same time, obviously, you could argue it's Earth 38, but she maybe would have pointed that out. But then again, maybe she wouldn't have because she might not have wanted to trip Kate Kane out with the fact that there's a multiverse out there. Maybe Kate Kane doesn't know that. You know, but this is when Kate Kane went down to like an uh, alternative bat cave, I believe, not the actual bat cave, but it was like a different kind of cool cavey bit. Um, I found like the smoldering interesting. I mean, I suppose it was like a superhero moment when she was walking in like, this means business. She is a member of the bat family, so you would be walking down and like, but her armor was in like a freaking tree trunk? I mean, I could be wrong, but I swear like her armor was just placed in like the, the bark of like a hollow tree trunk. It was kind of cool, but I was also thinking why? 
What? What? Either way, though, the introduction of Kate Kane, which I haven't even given my opinion on properly yet, is I digged her. Um, I'm I definitely feel like this episode left more to be desired uh, for her character, and I don't mean that in a bad way. I just mean. I think a lot of there's been a lot of overhype with the Batwoman character getting introduced and because she wasn't in this crossover as much as what we thought she was going to be Ruby Rose didn't really I feel sell her whole pitch to the audience I mean she did enough to think okay that's cool but I want more maybe that's a good thing but I feel like I want more in the direction of being sold on her completely if that makes sense I'm guessing that is what the whole uh, Batwoman show and development is all about obviously so they can sell us on it um, but like, I guess the fact that this is just meant to be a tease and, uh, an introduction to that character and nothing more, it's not even meant to be a backdoor pilot, uh, to her show, they served the job pretty well. And even more so when we got into the ba actual Batwoman armor and Arkham Asylum stuff, which we're about to talk about next. But for the time being, let's talk about Felicity actually getting hold of that quantum -y kind of building, that quantum -y kind of, like, rod which is meant to be some kind of magnet, which we found out is also somebody trying to breach through at the same time. It's kind of confusing, but that's what they were doing with that equipment. Uh, it gave a good reason, I thought, as to um, Curtis, uh, Felicity, and obviously Caitlin Snow being there and Diggle just hanging out. Why not? Uh, it just gave a good logical explanation for the Argus involvement, really. Um, and then this is when the 90s Flash came through, and I really... Really found this reminiscent of the Batman vs. Superman Ezra Miller moment when he was warning Bruce about, you know, Lois Lane, she's the key, blah, blah, blah. And this was kind of like that. Going through the Speed Force once again, he was like merging in and out. Uh, John Wesley's ship was trying to get this message across, basically saying that the book is key. The book of destiny. If you get the book, you can fix this. It was very... You couldn't not draw that comparison, really. But what I want to talk about is Arkham Asylum, because there was a, quite a bunch of Easter eggs in here as well, obviously. Uh, we essentially had quite a lot of the Batman's rogues gallery uh, in on the Arkham inmate cell door numbers, or the actual nameplates, and that is uh, of Oswald Cobblepot, Pamela Isley, who is obviously Poison Ivy. Uh, I think we even had Clayface in there. We, we even had uh, Ed Nigma, and the riddle was something like, what's blue? Uh, and green and red all over, uh, right next to his cell. Uh, we even had uh, Mark Guggenheim, which we knew was going to be in there because obviously he helped write all of this. So, you know, a little Easter egg there. So I loved all of that. Not to mention, guys, when we got to the Nora Free stuff later on, which I'm just going to skip to now very quickly, five seconds. We saw like the Bane mask. We saw like some teeth, like some Joker teeth, which I'm sure were like some of the teeth that he uses to like go haha or chatter on the floor kind of thing. There was a bunch of stuff. Now this is naturally when Oliver and Diggle uh, went to confront Dr. John Deegan and he was like, no, I'm not going to reverse it and he just disappeared. Um, it, it was it was actually as simple as that. He was getting away and they, like, they showed that Oliver flashed after him. I have no idea how he didn't catch up to him because he was only like ran down some stairs and he was retrieving the book. But whatever, plot I guess. I have to admit when um, we saw the debut of Psycho Pirate as well, which is really cool, I didn't really dig the mask. It was very plain. They could have done something more of that. And I did find that line quite cheesy when he was like finally the inmates are running the asylum it was just so i don't know cheesy I, i'm not saying i didn't like this episode and that means baby you're such a hater it just means that moment was literally like finally <laughs> do you know what i mean it just i don't know I don't know. But anyway, as I teased a second ago, to the Nora Freeze moment, uh, she seems to be, they, they might seem to be doing something a little bit different here. Uh, if you didn't know, this is Stephen Amell's wife, uh, Cassandra Jean Amell, I believe her name is. Uh, pretty cool that he got a scene alongside her and she was playing Mr. Freeze's wife. I, I noticed some other things, uh, Easter eggs. I believe there was like wind up penguin bombs on the floor. Alongside Bane's mask from like the Dark Knight Returns kind of vibe, we saw like penguin's glasses, I believe, and a bunch of other things, guys. I would love to know if you could point anything else out in this like kind of Arkham Asylum inmate, you know, equipment or like confiscated items room that North Freeze was searching through in order to get her husband's cold gun. Now, of course, guys, we also had Batwoman versus the inmates. This is what we've been teased with for the longest time. I have to admit, I was a little bit desensitized from this moment, even though I did take in and appreciate how cool it was. I love it, of course. Just like when Dick Grayson used a grapple hook to like pull back an enemy, just like what Batwoman did in this episode. I love that kind of stuff. The reason why I said I was desensitized from it, and it's kind of my own fault is <laughs> because the CW kept releasing clips like they released this clip I'm pretty sure before the, even the first episode of the Elseworlds 
crossover aired. And I just don't agree with showing big moments like that. Of course, suckers like me are going to watch it and then feel like when they see it on screen, maybe just as cool. But for me, I was just like, oh. But either way, this all kind of led into Arkham Asylum, back to the Nora Freeze uh, kind of moment because she was, uh, she blasted Killer Frost out the way, which was pretty funny. But this is when they accidentally knocked out some of Crane's fear gas. Now, obviously, that is the Scarecrow. I didn't know how I felt about this, even though it was a really cool way to bring in these characters, the Reverse Flash. Uh, for the Flash, even though it's Oliver and Malcolm Merlin for Barry's uh, Green Arrow, it, which is obviously meant to represent Oliver's fears. Because at the end of the day, this is Scarecrow's fear gas. Meant to represent and bring out what you fear. Uh, so Malcolm Merlin for Oliver is an interesting one. It definitely like does make sense in one way, but I would have thought with everything else, maybe it'd be fearing something bigger like i don't know the, the maybe diaz after felicity but maybe he doesn't fear that because of what's happened in arrow recently with diaz being apprehended either way though with the arkham stuff and batwoman as i said it leaves much to be desired in the sense that it was over before i felt like it started you know batwoman stops them fighting and then it's you know before you know it, it's supergirl saying goodbye to batwoman uh I, you know obviously they know each other like Kara knows that that's Kate Kane. I feel like Barry and Cisco should have been, at least Barry should have been able to figure that out. Maybe Oliver Queen as well. It was very obvious. But, you know, comic book logic. So I'm not going to nitpick that. I know somebody will say the whole Superman, Clark Kent, blah, blah, blah thing, of course. But either way, I like these two. I, and I feel like they definitely wanted to highlight these two because of, you know, two female superheroes could easily cross over in the future like Arrow does with The Flash sometimes or vice versa like with Supergirl or whatever. Now a huge part of this episode guys is when uh, Barry Allen did finally get through from Earth 90 and he was like hello John you're not wearing your ring and that is because on Earth 90 John Deagle must have been the Green Lantern which is huge. I mean how cool would that be if John freaking Deagle got the green lantern ring on earth one i would 100 percent be up for that that'd be pretty cool uh but yeah nice nice easter egg there really nice this is where at the end of the episode barry allen of earth 90 gave us the official explanation if you will, as to what the heck is going on and it's exactly as what i've said and um, what everyone else has probably been thinking setting up the crisis on infinite earth so how the monitor technically isn't evil but he's kind of doing bad things to get a good outcome so that is essentially as Barry Allen of Earth 90 said that uh, Marnovu, the Monitor, is releasing the Book of Destiny among the multiverse to test different Earths. Like he did test Earth 90, but it failed, so a bit of tough luck, I guess. That's all you get out of it if you fail. And ultimately, this is to test them for a crisis that he believes is coming. The Monitor thinks that the Elseworlds created by the Book of Destiny, like what is being created right now, these Elseworld situations, approximates the collision of realities we're facing. So I think what he's trying to say there is that what is being created right now is is at least approximate to potentially also what the Anti-Monitor will be bringing with the collision of realities in the crisis of Infinite Earths to come. So I think uh, this is exactly the Monitor's motive. It, he's trying to liken or approximate the same kind of simulation, if you will, with this Elseworld storyline, giving the Book of Destiny to people like, you know, Doctor Destiny to wreak havoc, so he can liken it to what may be coming. And naturally, as the Monitor said, when they met in the street, that the crisis is imminent and that someone far more powerful than himself is coming, which is, duh, the Anti-Monitor. Obviously, our Earth is going to be the Earth that succeeds and will be facing up against the Anti-Monitor in most likely next year's crossover, which is blatantly what they're setting up. Book of Destiny got stolen with the Monitor just willing it. Gave it back to John Deegan, kind of made me laugh again. It was just like, you know, I offered you Godhood. Think bigger, man. Come on, think bigger. So, Doc's Destiny rewrites reality again, and that is when we get the Trigger Twin storyline of Barry and Oliver. And as I predicted from the promo images, I thought that that paper would essentially be telling them the story of what predicament they're in, and it exactly did. It said something like, Trigger Twins, blah, 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 wanted, blah, blah, blah. And that is exactly what we got, thus leaving us open to the next and last final episode of the Elseworlds crossover featuring this new rewritten reality. Now, how are Barry and Oliver going to tackle this with no powers? We're going to have to wait and see, but we also know other people like Cisco are all affected this time as well in terms of being a crime lord. So, Dr. John Deegan has fought bigger. Like, he's not only just affected Barry Allen... Uh, and Oliver Queen, it seems multiple people will be. Even like Jimmy Olsen is going to be involved and people like that. And then we've got the black suited Superman tease at the end as well. So guys, I think I'm going to wrap it up there. I enjoyed this episode quite a lot. Was it as good as the first one? I would say it's almost, it, it felt different. I don't know if it's like mega better. It was better in different ways because we got the Batwoman and we got Bruce Wayne Batman references uh, for the first time, of course, in the Arrowverse. We got more plot, actual 
you know, really concrete universal stake development here with the Anti-Monitor storyline, the Crisis on Infinite Earth storyline. But that first episode was a really cool, good impression. I felt like this was the bridge uh, to the third episode and hopefully the third episode will really hit it off with a home run with when the first episode was like hitting the ground running. This was just keeping up that momentum if I couldn't put it in any other way. But I'd love to know your thoughts down in the comments below, guys. What did you think of Elseworlds Part 2? I would love to know everything you thought about what I said in terms of my opinions on the Bruce Wayne leaving uh, Bat Gotham City after Batman had initially left. As always, links are in the description down below if you're not already in my Discord server. Of course, my social media if you want to follow me a bit more. And other places to support me a bit further like Patreon where it fuels the content that I create on this channel. But other than that, guys, subscribe for more videos on the Arrowverse just like this over the Christmas break. And of course, for the Supergirl Elseworlds Part 3 review tomorrow. But thank you so much for watching, everyone. I hope you have a lovely rest of your day. And I'll see you, people of the Arrowverse, in the next video. Goodbye.